So thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, please get settled if you haven't yet. And massive thank you to Eric and Ingrid for coming to the UCL Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose tonight. Um, we're thrilled to be able to launch, is this a proper launch, or at least to celebrate your book, Uneven Economic Development. I have the honor of having even written a chapter with Carlotta Perez in it. Um, and first of all, just really quickly, Eric is also an honorary professor with us. He's a professor of technology governance and development strategies at the Tallinn University of Technology in Estonia. Much of his work has been dedicated to teaching and researching in the theory and history of, of uneven development. And if you all like the work of people like Hajun Chang, he was a student of Eric's. A lot of those ideas actually really were launched by Eric himself. Um, this notion that actually we uh, uh, countries talk Jefferson, but actually act Hamilton is a quote from Eric's work and really unveiling the very visible hand that pretends to be an invisible hand. Eric's work has been foundational for that. Uh, Ingrid, she is someone who I really, really respect and see as a rising rock star in the economics profession. She's a heterodox political economist currently working as a lecturer in international development at King's College London. I think we wrote currently because we want her to come to us. <laughs> In the future, one of our professors. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> we already got Eric. <laughs> OK. Um, and together, what they address in this book is the complex reality of economic development. The book comes at a very important time as we're facing a crucial moment of transition. And I think what's really important in the book is showing how uneven development is not by chance. It's not like, oh, whoops, we're uneven. <laughs> it's actually in some ways been designed into the system by the very problematic kinds of economic theories that have led policy. And this is very much, I think, what's gonna be at the heart of tonight's discussion, um, linking that problematic theory, the lens that we have on a system, is not neutral in the same way that we say finance is not neutral. The form of finance affects what actually happens in the economy. Well, for sure, the way that we've actually framed our economic problems and the theory behind it has given us the kind of economic reality we have, which often then feeds back into the theorizing, so what sociologists call performativity. Um, so what we're going to do tonight is we will allow them both to say something about the book. I think we decided people's attention spans are usually maximum three minutes. So they're actually going to go beyond that. <laughs> uh, we're going to have about 15 to 20 minutes each and then open it up for discussion. Uh, what else? I can't remember. Someone wrote all these notes of things I was going to say and then I went off off the track. So now I'm off track. Um, so yeah, was there something else? Remind me something else to say? No? Uh, there will be questions also from the floor. You're taking them, Carolina? Yeah? And yeah, and just start thinking along the way of what your questions are. I think we're going to have at least about 40 minutes to field questions, so we're not going to cut that bit short, and that's precisely why we asked you guys to limit a bit what you're going to say. So thank you. Why don't we start with, is it Eric's going first? Yeah. Oh, and of course you should buy the book, and it's 70% off, you said? Well, I found on, 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 your, website? on, on uh, your website, it, it was, when I looked at it today, the discount had grown. Oh, well, maybe we but, made well, that up. We like to... <laughs> 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 no, anyway, buy it soon, discount it on our website. Good. Good. Well, uh, thank you very much to Mariana for hosting this uh, book review. Uh, bu book launch, it's really the book launch. Uh, and uh, I had published two books with, with uh, uh, Elgar before. On, on uneven development. One in 2004, uh, taking the Schumpeterian view, and one di on different uh, theories of economic development uh, four years ago. And then when they came to me and, and said, well, why don't you, why don't you uh, publish a book with us called A Modern Guide to Uneven Economic development. I, I just, I just couldn't resist. So, so, so I got hold of, of Ingrid, uh, who's also Norwegian, and and we we found that if we blend two generations of economists in, uh, interested in this, we would probably get a richer view. And and uh, 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 we also discussed. Well, let's try to mix genders a bit. And, and today, it's, since it's International Women's Day, I can announce that there are 15 
chapters by male authors and 15 chapters by female authors. So, of course, uh, that that wasn't planned that the launch would be today, but but it, it, it's suitable. So, and so every other day is Men's Day, so we're going to rebound. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, that, 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 that's, that's true. Uh, well, I think... Uh, uh, well, I started uh, wondering about why poor countries stay poor when I was a young man of 18 in Peru, and, and, and I wondered why uh, Norwegian bus drivers who were not more efficient than Peruvian bus drivers would have a wage that was 15 times higher. Mm -hmm. so, so I thought, well, I'll look that up in a dictionary when I, when I come home. And I didn't find any reply to that. So, so 40 years later, I wrote a book called How Rich Countries Got Rich and Why Poor Countries Stay Poor, mm -hmm. which has been translated into about 25 languages at the moment. So the, clearly there was, there was a market for that. For that. <clears throat> and I was fortunate enough to, to uh, uh, study uh, first in St. Gallen in Switzerland and then uh, at Cornell uh, with economic professors who had their education from before World War II. So, so, so I, I, I was really very lucky because I saw that the same generation, uh, uh, the, the younger professors would have been brainwashed in the US and, and, and they would be brainwashed totally into regarding economics. Mm -hmm. uh, but but I, I had people with other views and that also brought us into to studying the, the history of economic thought. An interesting thing uh, is that the best sellers in history of economic thought are about 100 of them, more than 10 editions before 1850. They, they are, a lot of them are not even in Wikipedia. So, so, so here is a tradition which is totally uh, forgotten. Uh, and if you, if you Google my name and economic bestsellers, you'll, you'll get that story. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> there was a great schisma in the late 1940s. Uh, you know, in Germany, uh, the, the, the Allies decided to, 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 to uh, de-industrialize Germany. They hadn't done enough damage <laughs> in two world wars in less than 50 years. Uh, and they, they launched the, the Morgenthau Plan. And the Morgenthau Plan was to de-industrialize Germany as a punishment. It's the worst thing they could think of. But then uh, the Americans found that industrialized East Germany was growing faster than de-industrialized West Germany. So it looked like the communists were winning. <laughs> and, and then in, on the 7th of June, in, 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 uh, at Harvard, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, George Marshall, uh, uh, makes a speech. And he says about the, pro the problem of the war, there is a face of this matter which is both interesting and serious. The farmer has always produced the foodstuffs to exchange with the city dwellers for, for the other necessities of life. This division of labor is the basis of modern civilization. I think that's a pretty, that's a pretty strong statement. Mm. And if you think, of why didn't the Americans manage to do anything in Afghanistan? You know, all the, all the millions and millions of dollars they threw into industrialization, the only thing they, which survived was an ice cream factory. And ice cream is a thing that you don't smuggle. So, so, so I think the, I also observed that in Zimbabwe, that the only person who was not, who was not complaining about smuggling was, 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 was the ice cream producer. So <laughs> at the present time, it's threatened with breakdown, and the town and city in this are not producing adequate goods to exchange with the food producing farmer. Therefore, the Marshall Plan, which re-industrialized Germany, the whole of Western Europe, from Norway and all the way around Turkey and all the way up to Japan. Uh, and it was a very, very efficient way to stop communism, right? And so look at the difference between South Korea and, 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 and North Korea. And then about at the same time, Paul Samuelson, in two articles, uh, Economic Journal in 1948 and 49. He used David Ricardo's trade theory to prove that international trade would produce factor price equalization. You know, regardless of what you, of what you produce, uh, trade will make everybody equally rich. I thought that was absolutely, totally counterintuitive. You know, economists don't say to their children, my son, my daughter, 
I observe that you're very efficient in in washing in the in, in the kitchen, so I think you should use a comparative advantage to get the job washing dishes in the restaurant. They don't say that to the children, but they, in a sense, they say that to the children of Africa. So, so, so we, we, we have some ethical problems here, I think. So uh, then you start looking at Ricardo. He wrote in 1817 the, the principles of economics. And if you put that into an engram, you will see that the star economist in, in, in the 19th century was John Stuart Mill, the liberal. But the liberal John Stuart Mill, whose book came in 1848, same year as, as Communist Manifesto, recognizes that all nations need infant industry protection. Right. So the great liberalist John Stuart Mill was a protectionist. Today's liberal will not uh, forgive him that, but that's the case. And then it was his father, James Mill. And then, you see, David Ricardo is there at the bottom, really marginal. And then comes the idea of comparative advantage, which we know came from 1817, and we, we understand that it must have been alive since then. It wasn't. You know, it starts growing slowly in the 1830s, and then in the, in, in the, really in the Cold War is when it explodes. Right? Uh, and the interesting thing is, I think, the role of demand here. You know, there was a big demand for a theory that proved that communism was lousy and the market would solve everything. And miracle, economic science produces what the market wants. And, and the, 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 the shaky thing in, is in a way that when the Cold War had been won by the West in the 1980s, the use of comparative advantage diminished radically. So, so I, I think this demand factor is really worrying. You know that 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 uh, the golden rule. You know the, is that the golden rule. The, the one who has the gold makes the rules. Mm -hmm. Is is uh, it, it applies here, and and I think we should we should be aware of that now when neoliberalism is dying. We should try to understand why it was born and when. So, uh, in the book we we. Uh, I'll just give you a brief overview of the book. Uh, we are talking about an even economic development. We are identifying the blind spots of mainstream economics. Um, and one of those blind spots is synergies. Um, if you ask uh, uh, Leonardo Bruni, who was the mayor of Flo Florence in the 1500s, when he was asked, why is Florence so rich compared to the rich of Italy, Florence and Venice? Well, he would, he would say, it's il ben comune, the common wheel, you know, the, the, the synergy. And these people, they almost said, if you want to know the wealth of a city, go into the city and count the number of professions. The, the larger the number of professions, <laughs> the richer the city. And, you know, if you think of that today, if you go into Kampala and, and, and Manhattan, you know, the, the, the same thing applies. So there's some old rules here, which I think we can go back to. We look at geography and even development, population density, attempting a non-ethnocentric approach to development. And there I've got two former students, Salah Shafiq, who is now here and happens to be in Morocco today. And so I want to, who's uh, uh, Chinese, both students of mine in, 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 in Tallinn. So uh, we, we look at the non-ethnocentric approach, which, so we take also the view how, uh, how the Arabs view the world and how the Chinese knew, uh, knew the world and how that was dominating for a long time. S then we have a chapter by Mariana Mazzucato and Carlota Perez on uh, on the role of innovation in, in especially rich but also poor countries, inclusive, sustainable, and innovation-led. Uh, very uh, a chapter that can be much recommended. And then we have different approaches. We have a kind of philosophical approach uh, that you know uh, the very abstract. Uh, we have very abstract theories, and we compared. Descartes and, and, and David Ricardo in their very abstract dreams and, 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 and how, how, how that uh, produces the wrong 
theories and, 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 and the long, wrong illusions. Um, we have a chapter on gender and development, uh, which my co-editor is going to talk about. Also, the dependency theory, the need to center imperialism, and uh, uh, people who work in China, for instance, an Australian colleague of mine, tell me that the, 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 the Chinese are very worried about, you know, they still remember what's called the unfair or unequal treaties that were forced by Europe on, 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 on Asia. You know, Admiral Peary uh, sails into a Japanese harbor and, 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 and says, uh, you know, if you don't sign this free trade agreement when I come back in here, I'll bomb the city to pieces, right? This is, this is uh, uh, cannon boat demo uh, uh, democracy. And he, he's also looked at the, the Chinese case, the Chinese and, and, and the Japanese case. And they're, they're both fairly s similar. And these people deeply regretted that they had signed treaties that they couldn't use any tariffs for 30 years. And this was while the United States was still at the heavy tariffs. Huh? So, so, so it's, uh, there's some ethical things here which are, which are interesting. Um, we have a chapter here with uh, an, uh, an Italian colleague uh, called Physiocracy, Guillotines, and Antisemitism Now. Uh, it's uh, the book, uh, rather famous book now, uh, Enlightenment Now, which is Bill Gates' favorite book. And, and we, we, we're saying, well, perhaps that was the wrong, that was the wrong enlightenment. You know, physiocracy started the, the, the tradition that you could make any crazy assumption and, and build theory on that. You know, they had the assumption that the only thing which is valuable is food, because man lives from food. So everything which is not food production is, 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 is not productive. And who paid them? Well, the farmers, of course, the feudal farmers. So this was, this was feudalism uh, in, in, in uh, <laughs> the vested interests of feudalism. And, and uh, of course, they wanted, you had to kill people uh, efficiently. And, 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 and they were also very anti-Semitic. You know, the, the third volume on, on, on uh, anti-Semitism uh, uh, is called From Voltaire to, to, to Wagner. So, so you, you wouldn't expect Voltaire to be an anti-Semite, but <laughs> in fact he was. So, so if you look at the Italian Enlightenment, uh, it, it is much more productive. And even the Spanish Enlightenment, which was very late, uh, is also, is also um, very, much, very much enlightened. And if you look at the bestsellers, there are, there are f the f only person with four economic bestsellers was the only anti uh, physiocrat, the Swiss Necker, uh, who was the Minister of Finance in, 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 in France. And when the news reached Paris that he left as a Minister of Finance, that's when the French Revolution broke, broke out. And he's the bestseller. And, and Kenet is not there. And my French colleagues hate me for that, but I'm sorry to say he was published in a journal. So he isn't, he isn't among the best bestsellers. And what was the name of the bestseller again? Necker. Necker. Ne ne How do you spell it? Uh, N e c c k e r, and and he has four books uh, that were published in more than more than ten editions before 1850. So so it's uh, uh, and and it's a remarkably sensible guy, you know. He understood that it was uh, uh, that the speculation in bread uh, was ruining France. Uh, that's when the famous you know, there's a lack of food in bread in Paris, well, one of the eat cake. That, that comes from that period, because there was much more money to be made by keeping wheat out of Paris than making bread. Uh, so so, so uh, that's a very interesting uh, historical period. Then we have Technological Retrogression and Persistent Poverty by Sylvie Andresen. It's an interesting case of Schumpeter in reverse. Uh, Efficient fishermen on the coast of India go out into the high seas, they, they, uh, they fish uh, and come back and live well. Then they invent the outboard engine and they can fish even more. Then because of the outboard engine, they empty the sea. And after a generation, they can't afford, uh, they can't afford the, the, the petrol for the outboard engine. In the meantime, 
they have forgotten how to sail. A generation has passed. And they now fish rowing along the coast. Technological retrogression. And the same thing you find in mining. You find it in, in Potosi, in Bolivia, the richest mine in the world. Uh, now it's, it's, it's uh, a few men with picket axes who go in there and take out the last minerals. So, so in diminishing return also brings uh, Schumpeter in reverse. So uh, I have a chapter on, uh, on Jakob Bielfeld on the decline of states. It's interesting that you know, there were more than 400 states in, in Germany after, after the, the 30 years war. And, and there were so many that you could make a theory of how they declined. And some of these reasons for decline are interesting. Uh, it kind of reminds you of, of Trump. Insane sovereign, military overextension, and, and pests and pests, you know, that's, so, so, uh, it's a very long list, and it's and it's interesting, and you can even find it applying applying now. And then we have free trade with former Comic Con countries as an equal exchange. You know what happened when we opened up the Comic Con countries? First, it was free, free trade that killed the industries, uh, and and instead you had you had migration. Right, migration came instead of deindustrialization combined with migration, uh, and and. Uh, we, it's interesting how these countries were, how, how different these countries were. Then we have recent escapes from poverty. Ting Shu, who's sitting here, is the author of that chapter. And uh, we have a, a Russian uh, number cruncher who used to work with the UN and in Canada, Vladimir Popov. I come to talk to him on a conference a couple of years ago. And I'd been to Uzbekistan. I, I'd known him for a long time. And I said, what, what, what a fascinating country. They, they have kept their industry. What are they doing? And he said, yeah, have you looked? I also looked at the numbers. It's wonderful. So he has a, this case study on why on earth uh, Uzbekistan uh, is so wealthy. And, and the answer is they continued the, the good old fashioned Latin American protectionism in a in a, in a, in a uh, reasonable way. You know, they don't buy wheat from the Ukraine. Uh, uh, they, they don't sell their wheat to Italy uh, for $200 a, uh, a ton, to take a number, and buy the same wheat back as spaghetti for $400, for $400 uh, a ton. They don't do that, right? Which is, which is what uh, the EU had a pro project on smart specialization, which talked about these things. Uh, but, but of course, traditional trade theory doesn't go through it. So then we have finance versus the real economy, uneven development, financialized capitalism and subordination, uh, Bonazzi, Kaltenbrunner, and Powell, and then unequal growth and the single country, the fiscal policy paradox, which gives you into uh, uh, Minsky and, 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 and uh, and uh, uh, financial crisis. So, so then we have identifying ecological and equal exchange. Uh, and in the end, uh, we have the important lessons from history. And I think perhaps the most important lesson from history is the balance of countervailing powers. It, it is, uh, if, you, if you look at uh, the, the only Modern, modern country that survived for a thousand years is actually Venice, and 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 if you see Venice and 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 Florence, what what they did, they had one administrator who was very well paid, and then they had one, they had a council eight or ten depending, uh, with ten people representing ten professions. So, so the, 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 the bankers and the traders of gold and silver had one representative out of eight, right? And, and this representation by profession was, was, uh, was, was kept stable. But the people sitting there, was, they, were, they were changed every year so, so that nobody could be around uh, for, for to, to get corrupt, and I think uh, uh, 
John, uh, John Kenneth Galbraith in, in, in his uh, books on, on the United States industry, he, he, he comes back to this point. And that, that, that's actually what happened, you know, between, between the capitalists and the labor unions when they still had power and the government, right? So, so this is perhaps the most important lesson from history, but, but there are more of them also. So I'll have to stop it here. I, uh, I've used my, my, my 20 minutes. <laughs> we'll bring you back for the discussion. And, and just listening to you, you've just reminded me, first of all, given um, Robert Wade's question during your exposition on reading lists, he has, Eric Reiner has the largest private library in the world, is that right? <laughs> by private, I mean owned by someone in their home. <laughs> That's what Reiner Cattell told me. It's not true? <laughs> No, 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 I mean, it's probably true when it comes to economics. Somewhere yeah, between exactly. 35 and 40,000 economics books. What do you do? You marry a librarian and you buy okay. 35,000 books. <laughs> we, we argue about the order of things, but in a way, that's what happened. But you've also reminded me, sorry, of two other things. Um, one is our world, which is that world that you have all these books about. So people actually care about growth and innovation, the kind of mix between Schumpeter, Keynes, and Marx, and so on. I think I've actually abandoned some of these issues. And it's so great. I mean, it just reminds me why I love this book so much. And, you know, I think Nathan Rosenberg was probably the only person within the Schumpeterian community that brought it back to that falsity of comparative advantage and kind of revived that notion of absolute advantage, which actually was in Adam Smith. You know, Adam Smith is seen as a free marketeer, but he not only talked about lots of other things like morality and so on, he actually, he had a theory of absolute advantage. And what I think is so interesting here is you bring back a theory of growth and innovation also to these theories and the defunct theories. But the other thing is, um, the reason I love Eric so much, and sorry, I know I'm supposed to be commenting later, is I think you're a very rare human being, not only because you have this library that no one else has, but I, th I can only think of three other people. So Marx, doesn't matter if you're Marxist or not, just Marx, Hobsbawm, and Carlota Perez, who, um, and Hobsbawm in a really interesting way, who you have an ability to go into the details of life, you know, like the granularity while also having a vision and a way to theorize the big trends. Most people can either theorize big trends and have no, both appreciation, love and understanding of the details um, or get so bogged down in the details that you have a hard time, you know, seeing, you know what I mean? Don't you think that's true? I mean, you probably want me to say that you're one of those too, but anyway. <laughs> oh, Well, that, that's a great, that, that, that is, of course, a, a great compliment. But uh, p uh, part of that is that I also have an MBA from Harvard. Okay. And well, then, the, then the world in the, at Harvard Business School. I worked up at Kinsey, I thought you were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Harvard Business School, you know, what economics call perfect competition, they call wholesale markets. Mm -hmm. uh, or we're in the wrong market, that's perfect competition. Mm -hmm. so, so you understand, uh, if, if you... And, and that's, Harvard Business School is based on German, a, 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 an American uh, economist who studied 12 years in Germany and, and the German historical school. So that's, wh that's where it comes from. So, 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 so um, I think that's, uh, mm. but thank you for a great uh, <laughs> compliment. And Hobsbawm, by the way, was a big expert on jazz, details of jazz. But anyway, mm. your turn. Thank okay. you so much, Ingrid. We'll bring us now to the deep depth. <laughs> yeah, I'll try. Um, so, um, since Eric started with um, saying that y so your education and career led you to eventually, 40 years later, write this book, uh, w uh, How Some Countries Got Rich and no, wh yeah, Why Some Countries Got Rich and Why Some, why some Stay Poor, um, it's worth saying that that book came out the year that I started my undergraduate <laughs> at the University of Oslo. <laughs> so, this is kind of, um, I already knew that there was uneven development. Uh, when I started my, my academic career. And, uh, and then, of course, we know each other um, um, f f from, yeah, a little bit of University of Oslo, but also because um, we're both involved in um, Rethinking Economics Norway, which is an initiative with very few heterodox economists, uh, and most of them actually are based abroad. So we're another kind of uh, illustration of that, because the... What is it called again? Rethinking Economics Norway. Rethinking, rethinking Economics, yeah. yeah. Rethinking, yeah. 
It's very big in the UK. <laughs> For some reason, the UK has a lot more heterodox economists based, like, you know, institutes like this with heterodox yeah. economists. You know, I'm at King's, there's people at SOAS. So there is nothing like that in more. Norway. I think so, <laughs> <laughs> probably. Yeah, we have to go outside. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Um, the mainstream of Norwegian economics, in my experience, is extremely neoclassical. It's extremely neoclassical. Yeah. And Eric Reinert is persona non grata yeah. in that whole community, as I have experienced myself. Yeah. He's, well, he's, hold on a second. We're going to give her her full time. <laughs> the Sorry. He's an exile. I'm an exile. I think I'm going to maybe go over here because yeah. I. Uh, uh, so Eric gave the um, kind of historical richness and a lot of the theoretical overview. So I want to kind of show what Mariana just said about how uh, that history and those theories are also grounded in contemporary um, uh, debates in economic development. Things that we care about like poverty, gender, ecology. There. Um, and they're connected. So each of these chapters, some of them are you know, very theoretical, very historical, but a lot of them also connect to these... Um, contemporary questions. And so we're pulling out some of these just to highlight um, for you. Gender, ecology, imperialism, dependence, poverty, financialization, and macro. Um, we thought about, I thought I wanted to put the ones that Eric wasn't going to cover, but we also talked about how we thought that Mariana would talk about innovation uh, <laughs> before in her remarks. So that's why I don't have innovation there. But of course, there's also a chapter on <laughs> innovation. <laughs> um, but we can talk about that maybe in the discussion. Um, and I, I yeah, shouldn't summarize your chapter anyway, so um, we can bring it back later. Um, so first of all, in terms of gender, um, so in the mainstream, uh, of course, as many of you know, in development economics, gender is often considered this kind of uh, la like women lack something and they're excluded from the market. They need to be integrated so that they can uh, catch up, you know, with a man who's walking <laughs> at the top and they just need to be in the same spot. Um, so they need to be integrated into the market. They need access to education. They need access to um, the banking system. They need to be included. Um, so we are taking a very different approach in this book, uh, and we got an excellent uh, agrarian political economist based in South Africa to write this chapter, uh, where she goes to kind of even beyond some of the kind of Marxist feminists that are writing in the Western world that see, you know, gender division of labor uh, as uh, something as fundamental to capitalism. Uh, and she goes beyond that, she builds on it, it goes beyond it to see how this is also, um, the gender division of labor was also fundamental for um, colonial capitalist accumulation um, and for dispossession historically, but also in, um, in uh, today, basically. And she demonstrated this, this in a variety of ways. Uh, and really, she kind of unpacks, like, what would it mean to think about inequality, gender inequality, uh, and the unevenness uh, from a third world perspective. So it's a really interesting um, uh, chapter about that that also kind of connects gender basically to um, the economy, the uh, production, agrarian political economy. Um, and then there we have, of course, we had to have something on uh, ecology as well. Um, and so we got Alf Hornborg, who looks at uh, ecological and equal exchange. Uh, and this, basically, what he does is he sees this as a systemic feature of world trade um, rather than, you know, again, kind of this mainstream way of seeing the environment as something separate from the economy, something that you need to fix, you just need to get the right price or whatever, an externality. Um, so it goes beyond that. Um, and so this whole, he gives an overview of this literature, which is very um, kind of complex about like how do you actually measure like unequal exchange, ecological unequal exchange. And he doesn't uh, agree with kind of the monetary ways of measuring unequal exchange of like, you know, trying to um, figure out like the monetary value of the, ex the things that are being traded. But he's interested in the physical aspects um, of this unequal exchange, which makes it even more complicated, obviously, to measure. Um, but he argues that this is super important because uh, production in the world is incredibly uneven. Uh, the places where resource, resource uh, exhaustion and degradation are happening 
tend to be in particular parts of the world. Uh, and that exhaustion and degradation tends to benefit the consumption of people in other parts of the world, right? There's this incredibly uneven physical um, exchange that has very harmful impacts for the environment and also is linked to very skewed patterns of consumption. Like cashew nuts. Like cashew nuts. Yeah, could be. We eat them at cocktail parties. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Another uh, example that I thought about maybe since we have this like Norway theme here <laughs> is Tesla, um, which you know we love to praise in Norway because we're just so environmentally friendly uh, and we have the highest Tesla per capita. Um, and there's very little pollution because of that. But of course the Tesla, uh, there's, it takes a lot of environmental degradation, extraction, <laughs> a lot of labor to produce the Tesla and to transport all the parts, you know, the whole global, global value chain. And that, you know, is not that pollution, that degradation is not uh, borne by the Norwegians who are living in a very, you know, happy, um, happy pollution-free life. Um, so that's something that you could capture with this kind of, um, this kind of framework. Uh, so what he argues then is that if you want to um, change the system, actually it's, you ha need to kind of go beyond the market mechanisms, you need to go beyond just trying to find the right price, so even like, uh, in a way it's also a little bit of an indirect critique of um, trying to, you know, um, trans transfer uh, compensation to countries in the global south, or even reparations, he's saying like it can't just, can't just be about money, it needs to be about changing the way we physically organize production. And then, uh, imperialism and dependence. So um, again, kind of contrasting to um, the mainstream way that uh, Eric mentioned very briefly at the beginning of like seeing developing countries as latecomers, just again lacking the things that developed countries have. They need the right institutions, they need to modernize, they need to become more capitalist or more of whatever that rich countries are today. Uh, theories of dependency and theories of imperialism again see this like unevenness as a fundamental feature of the economic system. Um, so I have two chapters on this uh, in the book where I kind of go into the theoretical debates about dependency theory, imperialism, what it means um, and to what extent it's relevant today. Um, so dependency theory is a very complicated um, theory, it's not a theory, it's a, it's a lot of different theories. Um, during my PhD, I, w I was interested in dependency theory and I wanted to kind of use it and apply it. Uh, but then as I started reading, I realized that, you know, this is extremely uh, complex um, theoretical tradition where actually there is no dependency theory. It's uh, a research program with um, lots of different debates about, you know, what causes, what drives um, uh, uneven development, essentially. Um, what are the constraints? Um, what is conditioning the periphery and why and how has this historically evolved and there are extremely different viewpoints on this and like a lot of debates. Um, so um, I, in that chapter I kind of uh, discuss some of the weaknesses of dependency theory, um, why it's been discarded and which I think has a lot to do with demand as Eric mentioned. Uh, it became very uh, um, unpopular um, to bring up a theory that kind of questions the whole global economic system. So it was very, very marginalized in the 80s. Um, but there are also people that are now, today, looking at how can we think about what, what can we save or what can we use from dependency theory to understand not just ec like economic forms of unevenness, but also other forms of oppression like gender and, and uh, racial oppression as well. Um, and then, um, in the imperialism chapter, I look a little bit at how we can, how we need to understand colonialism and empire to also understand how financial systems evolved historically and how they operate today. Um, so I kind of use, use um, draw on some work that I've done with um, Kai Kodenbrook and, 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 so, and Dongo Sambasila. Um, yeah, so that's just a brief overview and this leads me to, I think, the finance uh, chapter. Uh, so again, contrasting to the way finance is often um, conceived of in the mainstream is that you know the problems that developing countries have is that they need to respond to you know the fin financial volatility in the global economy or that they you know don't have the right domestic factors they don't have the right institutions they don't have the right um, policies etc 
So we got, um, we got a chapter from Bonizzi, Kalterbrunner and Powell that work on subordinate financialization, um, but that also, now in this chapter, they talk about how uh, the global economy, global capitalism is financialized and how that leads to uh, uneven development and what the implications are for countries that are subordinate. Um, and they argue this goes, you know, it's a step away from looking at just finance like the mainstream does. It's also a step away from looking at financialization in the heterodox literature, which often just sees like, oh, is our countries in the global south, south financializing or not? Um, to what extent are they and what does that mean? Instead, they're looking at, okay, what is the system and um, how does it, what does it mean for what developing countries actually can do? Um, uh, so they argue that financialized capitalism, although you know capitalism was always uneven, financialized capitalism allows for this unevenness to get even worse, uh, because not a, now these like transfers of value um, to a larger degree are like f uh, captured by financial capital across the world, and this market-based finance approach that the World Bank, the IMF, OECD is kind of pushing, uh, which Daniel Gabor has critiqued extensively, um, kind of provides like a infrastructure for increased extraction um, is what they argue and show in this chapter. And they say that the political consequence then is that yes, you can try to control capital flows. Yes, you can try to have industrial policy. You can try to kind of protect your economy, but if you really want to change this subordination and this inequality, you need to actually, um, you need to actually have change at the global level. So it's a much bigger challenge. Uh, in terms of policy recommendations. Um, so that's the finance one. Um, then we also have poverty reduction, which Eric didn't talk about, but in the introduction we have, um, we also have a, a chart about um, develop, development economics and, um, and how it's turned towards looking at poverty. So symptoms of uneven development basically, rather than like the forces and the drivers. Um, so poverty is like a re very important topic in development economics. Um, if you are like a student of development economics, you'll be learning a lot about education, healthcare, how do you get, um, what are the best interventions to get, you know, kids, no, mothers to get vaccines for the kids and stuff like that. Um, so this often tends to disconnect the policies for poverty, poverty reduction from the rest of the economic structures um, of the country. Um, so in our book, of course, we try to you know, uh, reconnect poverty with the institutions and the economic structures of um, countries. And we have one um, chapter by Ting Xu, who's here, <laughs> you can talk to later about this, and the reception, which he looks at the institutions um, in China, uh, 1970 to 1990, to argue that you need to understand like reform of property in rural land in order to understand how China escaped the uh, so-called poverty trap. Um, so she makes this connection using old institutionalist theory rather than the new institutionalists that tend to look at just um, property rights, um, but rather she looks at the diversity of institutions and how they connect to um, different ways of, uh, uh, different forms of production. Um, a very rich chapter. Um, there's also kind of the, op the opposite example, with, uh, which Eric already talked about, so I won't go into it um, much, but Sylvie Andresen, another heterodox <laughs> economist from Norway, there, um, she uh, did this research in Malaysia and Sri Lanka, where she looks at uh, technological regression and episodes of that and how that is linked to increase in poverty. So the opposite, basically, not a success story, relative success story like China, but rather a, a very... Um, negative negative story, but still another example of how poverty is connected to um, how production is organized and done. So yeah, so this kind of just tries to remedy this problem that there's often this disconnection in, in the mainstream. I think this is the final um, topic that I want to talk about. So uh, trade, um, macroeconomic policy challenges. We have a few different examples of this uh, in the book a few different chapters, uh, again, trying to uh, connect macroeconomic policy, trade policy within, um, within the context of uneven development. Um, so we have the Uzbekistan case by Vladimir Mirpopov that Eric already talked about. Um, and there, 
you see very clearly that so Uzbekistan didn't do the whole Big Bang uh, liberalization thing after the fall of the Soviet Union. Rather, they had like very gradual privatization, lots of industrial policy, and they used their exchange rate a lot, uh, devalued it as a, a form of industrial policy. Um, and then uh, kind of opposite to that, you have um, Jan Kregel writes about the Eurozone and uh, how the Eurozone constraints the space. So a lot of Eurozone countries can't do what Uzbekistan did. They can't use their exchange rate, for example, as a form of industrial policy. Um, so having this limited space leads to a lot of vulnerabilities and, and inequalities and uneven development within the, the EU as well. Um, and then, yeah, there's uh, integration of post-Soviet economies into the EU. Again, this is another example of how this led to yeah, massive deindustrialization and increased uneven development um, in Europe. So, to sum up, we're doing okay with time. Yeah. Um, so, centering this aspect of unevenness in the book. Um, is heterodox in itself. So this is uh, not something that you will it'll see a lot in mainstream um, development economics courses. And we, um, the chapters yeah, are rich on historical elabor elaborations um, and history of thought. And um, we also you know, made an effort to really go into non-Eurocentric frameworks, uh, frameworks that theorize from the South um, and contrast these with what we see as Eurocentric frameworks. Uh, yeah. Uh, and then, yeah, just to make the final point again about like how, you know, the history and history and history of thought is super important, um, but connecting these two kind of um, things that are relevant today is also, um, you know, fundamental if we want to use this to actually understand what's going on uh, today. So that is it. Thank you very much. I was going to say, people in the back come in the front because there's many seats, but there's not. There's one stool. <laughs> so have, feel free to come if you can't see on the stool. Um, so thank you so much. Um, you just, I didn't know you wanted me to talk about innovation. So actually, my first question, I'll throw it back to you guys, is you, um, you, you did something that is so dear to the Institute. Like We talk about practice-based learning, practice-based theorizing, getting our hands dirty with reality, both in the work we do globally, but especially studying case studies and bringing back the learning to the theory and back again. Huh? But you didn't actually talk much about methodology. And I noticed that one of your um, blurbs here by, uh, God, I can't see anything. Hold on a second. Uh, Luis Carlos Preser Pereira from the Fundação Getulio Vargas in Brazil said that at the core of this edited book is a crucial place of imperialism and explaining uneven development. Eric is an outstanding development economist and criticizing Eurocentric orthodox economics, which is expressed in mathematics. He, Ingrid, um, and other authors reveal notable knowledge of economics and the history of economic thought. And that idea, which I actually often hear talked about from the rethinking economics youth, <laughs> who are like the, you know, at the front line of changing how we think, that somehow there's also too much economics. Carlotta and I often have this uh, debate. I think it's sometimes misplaced, because the real problem is the type of mathematics, the type of mathematics, sorry, not economics, the type of mathematics that we use, the type of methodologies that we use, is really important to dissect as opposed to saying it's been over mathematicized, right? So, you know, Schumpeter's whole point was that feudalism, capitalism, totally different. Feudalism, 500 years of inertia. We have capitalism where firms are competing via innovation, and yet we have a body of economic thought that to talk about innovation, you have to talk about imperfect competition, right? So, we have a benchmark of perfect competition theory not only built on comparative advantage and so on, but it's about representative average agents, it's about unique equilibria, diminishing marginal returns, all these things we don't have when we talk about innovation, right? There's multiple equilibria, path dependencies, constant differentiation as a long run, not just a short-term phenomena. So the kind of economics that then was, sorry, mathematics, that was used by those traditional economists, it's not surprising that they leaned on Newtonian physics right, for the type of math. Whereas a lot of the Schumpeterian evolutionary economic has leaned more on biology 
in terms of mathematics from biology. So already there, it opens up a whole you know thing, which is it's not about too much math, too little math. It's what type of modeling, what type of mathematics. And if you could just say a bit more about this role of specific methodologies, even within mathematics, let alone other types of methods that you grapple with in the book in terms of that feedback between problematic theory, problematic policy, and problematic methods. Because the methods bit, I didn't hear either of you mention. <laughs> no, I, I, I think that part of the problem that, that um, uh, Paul Samuelson created uh, also with these articles that I mentioned uh, is, that, is that he said that uh, in his thesis that mathematics is a language uh, and uh, that throughout, you know, if you wanted to be an economist in the US, you had to, you, it was mandatory to read German. So that's why we find that the old German classics have never been translated into English, because the, German, the Americans had to read them in German. Uh, and, uh, and, and there is a problem there, I think, with, with, with diversity. Uh, if you if you want to and language if you want to write a thesis on snow in swahili there is one word for snow as far as i've been able to check so if you want to write a thesis on economics you should use the sami language in northern norway a colleague of mine there at the sami high school sami university college wrote a thesis, her thesis on that and there are 350, 315 different words for snow. You know, they, they, they live in snow and, 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 and the reindeer, how to get to the food, you know, all these qualities of snow which they have to live with. So I think writing about economics uh, is a bit like writing a thesis on snow in Swahili. That, 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 that you, you, you don't have the vocabulary because you, you don't have the diversity. And, and I'm sure it's much better to use, to, 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 to use biological metaphors, clearly. Uh, 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 but I, I don't think it solves the whole problem, because it doesn't solve the problem, the, the problem of, of, of diversity, really. So, so, so uh, well, if, if, it's, if it's useful, I think the, the, the key thing is, if it's useful, fine, let's use it. If, if it's not useful, and you see that by testing, then, then, then we shouldn't use it, because you're lo locked into... Uh, a box. That's that's what I'm what, what I'm afraid of. But so maybe Ingrid, you can come in on this too, because I think one of the issues with that is I know that you know Danny Roderick wrote that book. I can't remember the title. Something about many. What's it called? Many. You're Mr. Reader. Many tools. Many policies. Different tools. What's it called? Isn't that a kind of rules? No, it's, it's it's it implies something that oh, but we have a whole toolbox. Why are we just using one tool? And I guess what I was trying to get at is that there's different assumptions beneath those tools. Mathematics, using my words before, is not neutral, right? The point about biology, for example, is you can have distance from mean dynamics. You know, the, the work that many of us did early on, what was it, 30 years ago, is all about that average actually doesn't matter. It's how different you are from the average that actually then allows you to explain growth. And yet all the mathematics we use is around that average. So kind of unveiling these assumptions that are hidden almost behind some of this modeling. And I'm only kind of pressing on this because there's a lot of PhD students here who can only actually get their PhDs passed even when they're looking at uneven development and poverty if they apply some sort of method or they can only get published if they apply some sort of method. And we don't have enough of a debate about these like specific assumptions behind some of these methods, including the sex, including the sexy methods like agent-based modeling, like somehow that's really cool, right? And so maybe, especially because you're of the generation that is also going to these conferences with agent-based modelers, that somehow just because you bring complexity into it, all of a sudden you're heterodox, when actually a lot of these models are still quite conservative in terms of the stuff you guys are talking about, right? So there's this illusion of differences and how cool we're, we're not just using Newtonian physics, but we're not talking about the the assumptions underlying different methods? Yeah. I think that's a great question and really important. And I think, so one time as a student, I asked a famous development economist <laughs> uh, about heterodox economics. He was a mainstreamer, or open-minded mainstreamer. Um, I, I thought about it, but then I was like, but it's being recorded. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I can tell you later. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> uh, Harvard economist, yeah. Uh, and I asked, you know, um, what do you think about heterodox economics? And there's so many uh, interesting insights. And he said, you know what? 
I think all those insights are great, and we should totally uh, get them on board. It's just that you just need to translate them into the language yeah. of ec uh, mathematical economics. <laughs> so basically, again, assuming that it's neutral, right? Yeah. Uh, but if you translate heterodox ideas into mainstream mathematical language, it's not heterodox anymore. It's it's then it has to be neoclassical uh, well, or late well, neoclassical. Well, I was actually suggesting that's not true. It's specific mathematics, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah. So that's yeah, one yeah. Uh, one part of it is. Um, mm -hmm. Math, math, the math, math in the mainstream, yeah. right? Um, that you need to do to get published in top journals. Then you need to make specific assumptions, and that uh, it's not just uh, translation language; it's actual, a completely different theory. Um, so that's really important. And then uh, also because um, the way he suggested, and this is imp important for students as well, I think that, that he was suggesting that if you do that, it just becomes clearer and more rigorous. Right. Uh, it doesn't change the meaning. It's you know improving rigor, and that's um, I think uh, fake. Yeah. Um, but yeah, in heterodox econ, you have of course lots of um, people doing math. Um, this famous uh, economist again would say that heterodox econs just aren't rigorous enough. They're not doing math. They just need to you know be more rigorous. But actually, there's loads of modeling happening, yeah. uh, and we have uh, Jan Kregel, He does some modeling in, in um, post-Keynesian modeling in, in one of our chapters. Uh, but you also have Marxist uh, analytical Marxist models and all kinds of different uh, math and heterodoxy that takes completely different assumptions um, that doesn't need to assume equilibrium or uh, rational agents or anything. So I think what we kind of need is to kind of move to a point where you can ask a question about economics uh, and then let the methodology um, the question determine the methodology. Yeah. Whereas now what basically needs to happen is that you can't ask any question. You are limited by your methodology. If you have to you know, do randomized control trials, which are the gold standard, yeah. allegedly, in development economics, then you can't ask questions about um, unequal exchange, yeah. for example. And Phil Morawski actually argues in a book he wrote called More Heat Than Light that at the time that the physicists were leaving Newtonian physics and going to quantum, the economists just went to the Newtonian stuff in a very non-scientific way. They said, we want to prove kind of Pareto optimality. What's the kind of math that's going to allow us to prove it, right? Which is not about understanding the world and then saying, oh, all these tools I might throw at it. So last question on just this is, you talk about in the introduction random control trials. And I think it's just an important thing maybe just to say something about because there is a bit of capture <laughs> in terms of the methods using RCT mm -hmm. uh, to look at issues of development and even uneven development. So those that are looking at these deep problems of poverty that do care about poverty, that do care about uneven development, including recent Nobel Prize winners, uh, Esther Duflo, um, are very stuck on that method. Do you want to just say something about how much we've skewed or a way of looking at things through that method and what it's done to our understanding of the problem? That's your generation. <laughs> My generation, yeah. Uh, sure, I think, yeah, uh, it's, uh, it's... And what's wrong with it, I guess. Yeah, what's wrong with it. Um, so, it skewed uh, things a lot because, um, I mean, in a way, what's a bit uh, frustrating about it is that the, they present themselves as these um, rebels in the academy, and that they are different from the mainstream because they are empirically driven, and they just want to find out what works. They don't care about equilibrium. They don't yeah. care about, you know, whatever. They don't care. And like in Duflo's famous um, uh, TED Talk, she basically says, you can't possibly know if aid works or not. You can't know these big questions. We just can't know. It's impossible. We don't have the methods to identify causality. Does aid work or doesn't it? We just we can't know. What can we know? Whether um, someone is more likely to keep their kids in school if there's uh, school meals. <laughs> Whether you know these super super tiny interventions, which they you know if you do randomized control trials on those aspects, you can find an answer on like what an intervention does in a particular village. Um, but that's treating a uh, kind of symptom of poverty. It's trying to see, like, oh, how can people live a little bit better? Um, maybe if they can eat at school, you know, rather than actually uh, addressing the big questions. And I think it's also wrong that we can't know anything. That's, you know, it's limited by her yeah. method again, right? Um, so it comes back to what he's good at, which is knowing how to do the details without getting drowned into the details. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's. Uh, 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 this approach, I think, is very is is, is is very very dangerous because it it we do know a lot, uh, you know. We we have a history of I've myself been at work in about seventy countries, and and to me there are seventy case studies, 
and 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 you can learn from these case studies. What what do they have in common? Yeah. Uh, they they have in common that uh, those who developed fast get got rid of feudalism fast. Uh, and the three countries that were invited into the EU and didn't want to join were the only three countries in Europe that never had feudalism. Iceland, Norway, and Switzerland, right? So, so, so there are a lot of institutions there that, that hinder and institutions that, that, that promote. And, 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 and not having a lot of uh, natural resources uh, could be a blessing, like Japan and, 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 and Switzerland, right? right? You, you, you have to go deeper into the value chain, so to say. And, and, and th this is an important thing. You know, the further you are away from the raw material, the better, the better you're off, right? You compare a, a, a huge block of marble and what Leonardo da Vinci did, did to it. You know, this is the Italian economists at the time were, were, were talking about that. You have to see the difference between a heap of stones and a, a heap of logs and a house. If you don't see that, you, you don't get it, right? And and that has to do with adding man's knowledge, right? So 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 this that is is a uh, this is a process of adding knowledge. And in certain circumstances, when you are poor and resource when you're resource poor, you have to be more you have to be more uh, inventive. So so I think this is. Uh, th th this is clearly important. I'm glad you, you, you raised that thing because I think that's really a dead, yeah. a, a, a dead yeah. sense, as was you know, the, the, millenn the millenn Millennium Development Goals, uh, I think was uh, you know, also a blind, uh, a blind alley. And, and I was, uh, I, I had uh, a friend of mine, a Malaysian friend of mine, Jomo, was the Vice Secretary General of the UN in charge of economic affairs. And we were sitting there in a meeting going to discuss the, 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 the Millennium Deve Development Goals and we were four economists sitting in the back room and we were all against it. Mm -hmm. And, and Jomo says, Eric, you have to say that uh, because you're the only one who don't have a job to, to, to lose, mm -hmm. right? So, so, so that, was, that was one of my speeches in, in, in plenary session in, in the UN and I could, I could look at the people, the tourists who were coming on the balcony in the, at, at the end of the room. But, but the, the, the problem is that if you're saying the wrong, time, the wrong things, you are actually not, uh, you're, not, you, you, you're, not getting, you're not getting a job. You were, you were mentioning Sorry, that I, as well. I was about to go to the audience, but this is too interesting. Can, can you just say exactly what your critique is of the Millennium? Development goals and perhaps of today's sustainable development goals. Well, the Millennium Development Goals were clearly treating uh, symptoms uh, rather, rather rather than rather than causes, right? Mm -hmm. And and uh, uh, you, you had uh, the, the main person in this uh, talking about malaria nets, right? Uh, and 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 and. Uh, uh, we should distribute malaria nets to the poor because malaria was such a big problem. And and then I spoke to some African women who said, "Well, we don't we we don't get bitten in bed where where this where this malaria nettings would help us. This uh, we, we're getting bitten in the field. Yeah. And 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 so we gave we gave these malaria nets to the men." To use for fishing, <laughs> and the sad thing was that they were poisonous, so the fish died. Wow. So, so, so that there, there are a lot of there are a lot of dead ends here, and 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 I think clearly when it comes to the uh, 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 the modern goals of keeping nature, we have to be aware of technological change. You know, if we, if we think of w when the car was invented, uh, there was already an electric tram in Berlin in the, in the 1870s. And there was, uh, and, and of course steam, there was a steam car because steam was the thing driving anything, everything. And then you have this guy outside, the Bentz, who comes with, 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 with the piston engine, completely from the outside. 
nobody would have bet on on bents, right? And and I think we are uh, we we are in a similar situation, and that's where Carlotta Perez comes in also with the with with, with, with the inventions. You know, we 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 don't know if. Uh, we don't know ever more, but do, do we know if if it's uh, solar power or or wind power? Uh, and the wind power probably should not be on land. If it's on land, it should be along the highways, and not where the reindeer are 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 <laughs> are, are, are eating. Um, but then I have uh, an engineering friend who says who, who says that you know the, the solution here is clearly. Uh, thermal energy. If you drill 90 meters into the ground, you can tap for heat as long as the planet is heat hot inside. Anywhere. Anywhere. Well, see, maybe it's, it's le less in Siberia and more in Siberia and less somewhere else. And, and, and actually that's working. But the, I'm, you're wondering, why is that technology not being used more? I spoke to somebody in, in Africa and and he was uh, a minister of energy in an African country, and and they had problems with lack of oil, and but they had never heard of it, mm. right? So, so so I think we we have to look at the uh, at the different technological options, and we don't know which one is going to win. I I bet on thermal thermal energy, uh, but perhaps people can't make money on it. You know, drilling a hole in the ground is not very it's not it's not very expensive but oil and and windmills are so perhaps it's it's it, 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 you can't make money on it so. okay I'm gonna, let's pause so we should come in with questions now to make sure we go around i thought we could get three questions to begin with do you have a pen to write or are you good at remembering <laughs> okay so why don't we go one question in the back one here one there because it's international women's day i'm going to start with the women any women Come on. No, I am sure you have a question. Anyway, why don't we start then with Robert. Sorry, uh, raise your hands again. So, yeah, so I'm just going to do bum, 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 then I'll come back. There we go. So we'll start with you, then we'll come to Robert, and then did we have one in the back or no? The back will stay silent for now. Then we can go then to you, yeah? So one, two, three, good. Hi, thank you so much. Um, you spoke a lot about um, sort of uneven economic development, how that is viewed as heterodox in itself, and you know, sort of how that's not well taken on board by mainstream, and you spoke a lot about that, and that was great. I sort of can grapple with why we, why sort of, what are sort of like the main differences in sort of resolving inequalities in sort of developed countries, like why we separate developing countries so much from developed, um, because I feel like the last time I checked, we also have a lot of problems with inequality um, and why these theories cannot meet more often and why do I have to sort of go and study developmental economics even in a sort of like mainstream way, way to sort of ask the right questions about the inequality. Um, if Got you it. could sort of... And if, if everyone can say, it, if you want your name, but especially maybe like where you're studying... Oh yeah, you're yeah. So I'm Julia. I am a final year undergrad at UCL. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm Julia Wojciechowska. I uh, am a final year arts and sciences student at UCL, and I'm taking a few courses. I'm doing the everything capitalism. Okay, great. Robert, here. Um, can you say something about Can you say something about um, how your arguments have been received in uh, the main Western-run development organizations, such as the World Bank, such as the IMF, such as the IDB? Um, such as the ADB, Asian mm -hmm. Development Bank, African Development Bank, um, and also uh, how your ideas have been received in the uh, Norwegian economics community. And the World Bank is looking for a new head, so how do you um, And Robert, he is top development professor economist in the world at LSE. <laughs> yeah, that was... That was fantastic. Uh, really looking forward to getting the book, especially with the seventy percent discount. So. <laughs> but uh, oh, I'm still there. <laughs> I say these publishers are such threat seekers that the initial price is so high. Yeah. Even with seventy percent off. It's still a hundred pounds. Okay. Well, 
So I have a question for uh, one each, please, if I can. So for, first for Eric. So that graph you showed with the, the theory to comparative advantage, like with the huge rise and fall, was absolutely fascinating. Seemed like there was a peak in the 1980s, and but this was precisely when the U.S. was uh, one of its most protectionist times in the post-war period with Ronald Reagan, you know, bashing down uh, Japanese automobiles and semiconductors and so on, putting, putting a 100% tariff on Japanese semiconductors and so on. So d do you think uh, it has any relation to reality or is this an ideological weapon? Uh, and maybe neoclassical economics writ large, is it an ideological weapon um, in this case to, to break down bar uh, trade barriers in the, in the third world? Um, and Ingrid, I certainly agree that we have to center um, imperialism, but I'm wondering like, where does the state uh, fall into your framework, and especially the US state? So when I think of imperialism, I think of um, US military finance and so on working together. So do you, do you see global finance subordinating or creating dependencies in, for example, Sub-Saharan Africa, like global finance writ large, or do you see this as Wall Street coupled with the US military um, and so on? Thank you. Sean Stars, uh, King's College London, at the best organized department uh, in the world. Best organized department. No, they, they, they don't know what they're talking about. Yeah. So, no, they don't. Uh, one question that follows Sean, just one. From, uh, we have a few questions, but just one from Mark Morgan, because it's exactly what Sean was um, getting at. So, the, well, first of all, he's saying thank you, that's excellent, blah, blah, blah. And then he's saying the use of the term comparative advantage was strongest during the Cold War. Which we, uh, the, Cold, the Cold War, sorry, until the 1980s, according to the graph that Eric presented. This seemed counterintuitive to the purpose of, Mar for the, of the Marshall Plan, that wanted to industrialize countries to prevent them from turning... Oh, Oops, someone move you, sorry. From turning, stop putting the question here, that moves. Uh, that's to prevent them from turning communist. What explained this discrepancy? Did you get it? No? Yeah. yeah. Do you want to repeat? Mas or menos. Mas or menos. No, don't repeat. Do you want to? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Why don't we get, yeah, I think. Did you get it? Is yeah, I have so many, so can I start? Yeah, we'll start <laughs> with Eric. I think. Uh, in the whole process, why development economics is different from other is that uh, is that there is a mandatory passage point which everyone has been through, and that's a period of of protection, right? So so uh, you have to protect for a while until you get your, manuf your manufacturing industry growing. You know, if you're lucky, like the United States had a very good theory with with with, with uh, uh, Alexander Hamilton, but uh, fortunately, they during the Napoleonic War they lost 70 to 80 percent of their imports. So strangely enough, this mandatory passage, passage point can be boycott. That uh, I've travelled several times up and down Zimbabwe, and and when they because of, of apartheid, they 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 were boycotted, and during that apartheid period. Manufacturing industry grew to 18 to to uh, to 30 percent of more than 30 percent of GDP, and they made sophisticated stuff like like medicines and plows, etc., etc. Cetera, et cetera. So, so that mandatory passage point is why we have to 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 uh, distinguish between the develop and the developing, and then we have had three wages, three waves of Deindustrialization. Uh, the first one was when Latin America, which had a relatively superficial industrialization, went from that very protective small markets uh, directly to free trade, free, free global trade. When are you talking about? I'm, I'm talking about from uh, in in Peru. It started, I think, in '78 with with. Uh, uh, the year of austerity. Austerity was 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 part of this, and 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 it probably started. I was a lot in Peru at that time, and we were observing the uh, went to the same supermarket, and the children who were who were who were begging for food a year before when we came back, they were begging for ca canned milk. You know? <laughs> so you could actually see it on the on 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 the street, and you could see how wages were shrinking. Uh, real wages were, were shrinking uh, tr tremendously, and but exports of raw materials grew. So, so if you look at the whole picture, it doesn't look that bad. But if if you look at the division 
between of the GDP between labor and and profit. Mm -hmm. you know, labor is 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 collapsing and profits are going up. You know the the Peruvian central bank stopped uh, publishing that in 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 in, uh, in, ni in 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 1990 because it looked so ugly, right? So 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 this is this is clearly. Uh, what, oh, thank you very much. <laughs> This is clearly uh, one of the problems. And then uh, we had a second wave of deindustrialization in, in, in the former Comic-Con countries. And, and Jan Kregel, who is one of our authors, wrote a book saying, hey, you know, what we should have done is we should have had free trade within the Comic-Con countries. And then when they had got to know bookkeeping, for instance, and get, got to know their costs, then we should have opened up for free trade with the rest of the world. But that was really extremely har harmful. So that was the second wave of wages of destruction. And I saw in, was it, you know, Financial Times recently, you, and also in, in, in other papers, you see that there is now a, a kind of wave of poverty even in England, right? So, 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 so this is, I see this as a, as a, as a, as a third wave. Uh, it started in Latin America, then it was former common countries, and now it's, it's the core. So, so uh, mm -hmm. with being deindustrialized, you know, there is premature industrialization and there is natural deindustrialization. But then when, when you have natural deindustrialization, you, pro you probably have a very uh, advanced service sector which can, which, which, which can, which can take, take, take over. Um, reception of these ideas. I think part of that paradigm shift was that we had Washington institutions, we, we, we had uh, uh, we had UN institutions, UNDP and uh, Industrial Fund in Vienna and all these things. They were running the show. And part of the transition that I was hinting at at the beginning was when the when the Washington uh, when the Washington uh, institutions took over, right? And and and, and the 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 uh, in Vienna they knew that a country b b below six percent industry would 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 fail. They knew that all the forty eight states in uh, nations in the world would that had failed had less than 6% industry. This was the kind of stuff we were working with, but nobody was interested in that. So, so uh, this is part of it. And I have to say that, well, I've been invited with a couple of times to write for the, for the EU, and, and, and they are relatively receptive, but some things they remove. Uh, and I was, I was asked by the OECD to write a report on uh, on the history of economic development since 1945 or 47, since the foundation of the OECD, and uh, there were kind of there were some radical persons there. For, for instance, an, it an Italian from Emilia Romagna who was who was uh, who was high up there. So so uh, I, I, it was a very interesting job, but in the cleaning process. Uh, they got an old economist from the OECD in, and they kicked out the stuff that I really wanted to present, and and so 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 it's uh, it's being uh, it it's being cleaned up. Uh, my ideas and and Norway is a strange country because in the other Scandinavian countries you have business schools who 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 who, who do Schumpeter. But in Norway, the business school in Bergen is 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 actually more Catholic than the than, than the than the Pope. They wanted to be more neoclassicals than the University of Oslo. So it's a, it's a strange country with that lack of that lack of, of, of diversity. Uh, yeah, thank you for really great questions. Uh, so I'll take uh, Julia's question first. I think it's a really good question because there is this, um, especially now that there's this rise of the term global development. Um, where you know a bunch of people in Manchester are arguing that you know you know development there's poverty in the UK we don't need development studies it's just all the same you know why do we need something different for developing countries right uh, because we have all the problems that developing countries have we also have them here informality you know precarity um, whatever um, which is true I mean there is in the, I mean first part of the what they're saying is not true but yeah there is unevenness and inequality everywhere. Um, so I think that's also part of uh, what I hope uh, that we're the argument that we're making in the book that uneven economic development is not just something that uh, is uh, along sort of core periphery or national lines. It's something that you can see actually 
in the UK, there's uneven economic development. Uh, and, in, and dependency theorists at the time, since I kind of mentioned them, they obviously um, saw that there was something that was particular about being a post-colonial country in a global hierarchical system that posed additional constraints on them compared to what, like they can't um, have monetary, independent monetary policy in the way that the US has, for example. And there's like a series of things that pose particular constraints. But they were also very um, aware that unevenness, and many of them wrote about the unevenness within their own countries as well, um, that it wasn't just a national problem, um, but something that you could kind of see everywhere. Uh, but I think this sort of um, uh, divide between post-colonial and the colonizers is something that I think legitimizes having theories that do look at that in particular. Um, so that's one thing, and then um, yeah, Robert's uh, Robert's argument. I, I don't have that much to say about it, except that uh, I did want to um, uh, talk about. I did want to impact the IMF and the World Bank before I kind of went into a PhD and do a PhD in economics. And before that, I was like working in a, in a civil society organization, and I was uh, lobbying the IMF and the World Bank. And I felt like ah, it's because I'm you know a young woman with you know without a PhD working for, for an NGO and they're not listening to me, they're not taking my arguments seriously. So let me go and become an economist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I want to become a heterodox economist because I want to really understand what's going on. And then they're still not listening. <laughs> so, so yeah, that's kind of, that didn't work. Um, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. But maybe we should send them the book and see there, they're not listening yet. Um, so they haven't taken on board these proposals. Uh, and then, um, uh, Sean, great question. Uh, I think, so, um, kind of one of the examples that I bring up in the, in the chapter is that um, when uh, the banking system was developed in Ghana, for example, it was kind of very much developed by uh, England. <laughs> it was the colonial state that decided how the banks were going to be run. And it was uh, organized in a way that basically the banks were there to extract, um, uh, to support the extraction of um, uh, trade, basically, to support the trade uh, to uh, England. Um, so it was very much a national endeavor, colonial national endeavor. Uh, but then what we argue that now um, that national relationship is not so relevant anymore. The banks are still oriented towards global capital, basically. Um, and it's not, it's not necessarily English, uh, the English anymore. Um, and of course, there are certain countries that have a lot of interest in uh, supporting uh, sort of the extraction of, glo of global capital. Uh, and the US state is one of them. Uh, and of course, they have a yeah, very big interest also in like, uh, maintaining, the, maintaining the, um, the dominance of the US dollar. Uh, for example, but it's not just the US, it's also the EU and the UK mm. that are like really pushing for market-based finance, for example, uh, to kind of make sure that economies are open, <laughs> uh, that it's easy to get money out, uh, to get resources out. Um, so that's kind of the, the one of the links that we're making, um, or that I'm making in that, in that chapter. Yeah. Can I just push back a bit, not push back, just something that you said, which is so important, which I would have also answered in terms of kind of the de-theorist, I can't even say it, a theoretical way that today we think about poverty and development. So for example, the fact that something you just mentioned quickly, but we should pause a bit and say it again, that the labor share of global income is almost at the lowest level it's ever been. The capital share is almost at the highest. The people who used to talk about this stuff actually talked about value. They had a theory of value, talked about both what was happening in terms of inequality in developed countries, had a theory of underdevelopment. And we've kind of taken the whole value debate, forget which theory of value, but the fact that there's different theories of value and linking that to different approaches to inequality and development, I think is a huge empty kind of vacuum. Um, I've definitely seen it, comes back to my point before about kind of what's happened in my part of the world, kind of heterodox, evolutionary, innovation, economics, it's so atheoretical. Um, they don't even talk about competition theory, let alone a, a theory of value. And you also don't have that much in there in terms of maybe reviving, not so much classical political economy, but the fact that actually we should be talking about theories of value. And uh, I, uh, the, the French French uh, economists have something they call a Fordist uh, mode of production, and the Fordist mode of production is that when when productivity goes up by six percent, wages go up by six percent, and you, you can see that. Uh, and for instance, in Sweden, you know that was 
that was behind the lo logic of the government for, for all the years after World War II. Um, but uh, uh, in the United States, if you look at the below the, the uh, statistics from the US Labor Department, you see that productivity and wage increase follow each other very, very closely until 1974. And in 1974, uh, real wages flatten out and productivity continues to go up. So if you, if you want to see where the change was, it's actually incredibly strong in, in, in 1974. And, and then people uh, were used to having more income and, 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 and the bank said, well, you could just, uh, you could just loan money instead of uh, instead of making it yourself, and then you got into this terrible uh, financial crisis, right? Which, which, which actually came out of, of of the breakdown of the Fordist mode of production, yeah. to put it that way. But also what we start to have in that period is this idea of corporate governance in terms of maximizing shareholder value, again, underpinned by theory of value. The fact that today we've had, the, just last year, one trillion in share buybacks is you know, yep. justified with that approach to talking about value. So even those who are against that talk about stakeholder value without actually thinking we need a different way of talking about. So I'm just saying this because this is what we obsess about in this institute. So three more questions. Can we get Nine. More? Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, please. Uh, we have like four or five, but I'm just going to go for two questions yeah. online, and then perhaps. Nine. And, yeah, and so okay. These four more here. Sure. Okay. So I uh, try. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> pressure. So one is on, uh, okay, I'm going to combine this two on global currency hierarchy, which is quite important. So it's basically a general question. Could you speak uh, to the impact of the global currency hierarchy on uh, uneven development? And the other one that follows that, I think I'm going to combine here, how do you terrorize the global hierarchy currencies and implications for rethinking international reserve currency policy to then mitigate balance of payment and currency crisis <laughs> in poorer country. So basically, if, if you consider global cu currency hierarchy, what happens to accumulate reserves and so on. I, and I have the other one I want to do, there are two questions on this, it's quite important, is corruption, right? And, and, and I, I want to actually read that also because the person has nudged me on Twitter, so I have to ask this question. So uh, understanding uh, development, of course, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, very often narrows down to the corruption path, right? Everything is corruption. So the question that he has for you is, how can you locate, how you both, the editors of this book, should locate the discussion of corruption in that book? Uh, and uh, if there is any, you know, do you view corruption as an imperial relic? a symptom of capitalism that's everywhere, but call different things. Um, you know, and uh, he, you know, his opinion, <laughs> corruption is used to actually as an excuse under neoliberalism and so on, but how, how that can be placed in that uneven development theory. And I think that's often. Great, thanks. We have nine in the back. Okay. Um, thank you to all our speakers tonight. I really appreciate. Oh, you need the mic. Oh. Okay. Um, I really appreciated the discussion. I'm a PhD student at the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. And uh, my question is, um, there are a lot of power asymmetries built into the structural governance of international economic institutions. So specifically, I'm thinking about the World Bank, the IMF, and the WTO, for example. And I'm thinking of things like voting power, veto power, and policy setting. And so some of the critiques that these institutions functions as agents of economic imperialism themselves uh, have been raised due to the reluctance to deal with, as I think was explored tonight, the roots of uneven development rather than the symptoms. And so I want to know to what extent does your book speak to those critiques? And um, I'm really excited to read the book, so thank you. Hi, my name is Kirti. I'm a student of IIPP doing an MBA over here. Um, my question was around the role of digital in this, uh, uh, in the in the problems that you spoke about. Uh, yesterday we were talking about uh, central bank digital currencies uh, having a role to play in inclusion uh, in in a developing countries. So that's just an example that I'm giving that uh, from where my question is coming. But I just wanted your views on the role of not technology, but specifically digital 
um, in, uh, in, in the problems you spoke about. Hello. So I'm a third year BSc economic student at UCL. And yes. <laughs> um, yeah, so what about population issue, I would say? What is your take on increasing population and maybe uneven population dynamics within developing countries and developed countries? And yeah, fertility rates, I would say. And like possibilities for maybe populations in developed countries to collapse and yeah. Thank you. And the last one there, and then we're gonna have yeah. questions I and have then one. have drinks. Okay. Uh, so <laughs> thank you very much uh, for the presentation and the panelists. Uh, really enjoyed uh, the discussion so far. So, um, well, to introduce myself, I'm not an economist. Uh, I'm a senior analyst in the data strategy division of the Bank of England. Uh, and so I'm more like a data scientist working with data. And I have two questions. First, I mean, um, how to end the hegemony of this mainstream neoclassical economist economics? You can tell <laughs> because it's not clearly, it's not driven by data. I mean, every time that I go through rigorous studies from the point of view of a data scientist, I mean, it blows my mind that uh, what's happening there, I mean, from the side that those, the papers that are actually approving neoclassical are so flawed and also the good ones are marginalized, it seems. Right. And um, so it's not driven by data, it's driven by something else, maybe money, maybe, I don't know, other things, you know it better. And the second thing is if, I mean, what is your advice for uh, someone who wants to study heterodox economics? So, uh, <laughs> well, I mean, someone who has not that much money to come to UCL probably, but um, no, I mean, uh, in, in the way that, let, let's ask it another way, what would you do differently if you wanted to start from scratch? Okay, something from the perspective of someone who has studied 35,000 books. So, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. So, both of you take your time, Eric, why don't you begin? We'll have Ingrid and then we'll have to close. Okay, good. Well, there's some very good questions. Um, uh, you, in the old days, you could regulate within Europe. If one country was doing poorly, you devalued, right? If Portugal was not doing well, they devalued the escudo. Um, but I think there was a lesson learned with the unification of East and West Germany. Uh, uh, the East German mark was perhaps on the black market, one to eight to the West German mark. And if you if you if you traveled to 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 East Germany, you had to you were forced to exchange so and so much per day at a favorable exchange rate. But when East and West Germany were united, the wages were united at a rate of one to one. So the East Germans in the beginning were extremely happy. They hadn't seen a banana for 40 years, and now they could buy a lot of bananas uh, and, and other things from the West. But what happened was that East German industry died out. And I, I had a professorship, part professorship at the University of Erfurt, at one time, so so I saw I, I, I saw this happening. I saw the, the 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 East Germans traveling to West Germany and East Germany being being in, in, invaded. You know, there were Polish immigrants who, who who came there. So 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 uh, the the fact that uh, you know the country that will always have will always revalue as a fantastic advantage in not having to revalue. So, so, so this scheme, I think, uh, I'm being an Austin now, but I think that the Germans actually understood what had happened in, in, East, in East Germany. If they could do the same thing with, with, with the rest of Europe, they, their industry would stay competitive forever. 
and 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 Italy would be, be industrialized, and Greece would be industrialized, and 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 and, and uh, so I think this is this controlled currency. If you if if you if you cannot adjust the currency anymore, you have to adjust the population. So the Greeks who don't want to go to Germany have to go to Germany, and even though the Germans really don't want them there, right? So this currency rigidity is is really is is really awful, and 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 I think this is this is something that you know. Uh, uh, Germany should not have got away with this. Is, this is this is uh, Helmut Kohl who said that oh we, we, do, we do a big favor. The euro the euro was essentially in the beginning it, it was only for the, only for the richest countries. Uh, but Kohl said well we do everyone a favor and we'll we'll we'll, we'll let the other countries also in, into the. In, into the, the the euro, and of course that was that was a disaster. The, the the countries that had inflation, you couldn't stop that inflation overnight. So that inflation went on for a while, and in the meaning in, in, in the beginning, at the same time, industry was industry died out, and instead of a Keynesian policy, who created a job, you had you had a Draghi policy, which created even more money. Right. So this this was this was a disaster and very important. But can I just say that if the answer stopped there, that would sound a bit mercantilistic, whereas your whole work is on also that kind of, let's just call it Hamiltonian, kind of industrial policy. Yeah, yes. It's, it's, the answer is both. So yeah, the, yeah, the, 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 the rates, you can explain it just through mercantilism. In terms no, of theory. Well, if you, uh, if you protect the countries that have always revalued, uh, if you prevent them from revaluing, that's industrial policy. Yeah. Well, I mean, really? well, look, look at what happened in look at happened with the, within industry in Italy. Look, if you looked at the price of coffee before and after the euro, you saw you saw uh, well, coffee I was. You, I just think it's, it's half the answer. And yeah. Yes. No. It, the, to use that. Like in Italy, they all use that as the answer. Italy was doing very badly pre-euro. Well, I ran a business there for twenty years. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've seen it from a, from a different from a different angle. Corruption is very important, and 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 uh, 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 the story I usually tell is that once we took over a company in southern Germany, and and. Uh, the sales manager said, uh, it was a happy day, and the sales manager came to me and said, oh, could we talk just the two of us? And I said, sure, sure. Uh, and well, what do you want to tell me? Well, I just want to tell you that when we sell to Volkswagen, I have to open the purchasing manager's upper drawer and put 500 or 1,000 marks into his upper drawer and close the drawer. And my reaction was, where did we get that money from? Because we don't have any sales in black, everything is 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 white, right? Mm -hmm. So my point is that 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 corruption is there everywhere. Uh, it's 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 can work like a commission, but it can also be very destructive. If you if you ask uh, uh, the the Malaysians why they built the new capital on a lot of islands. Uh, some honest Malaysians will say, "Well, we built them on islands because there are much more kickbacks on bridges than on normal than on no normal roads, right?" So I think it's it's it it is it is actually there. And and uh, uh, the 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 uh, uh, I think the the World Bank and the IMF are slowly changing, but. Uh, in, in Kazakhstan, I was I was in, in the presidential palace with two former w World Bank chief economists, uh, Justin Yufilin and the, the, the American guy with the with the mathiness. Uh, uh, American guy with who, who wrote about who writes about mathiness. Uh, um, well, so so yes, yeah, uh, yeah. Sorry, but two. Remember, yeah, Paul Romer. Uh, and 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 when I spoke about the future of Kazakhstan, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, what we should do, and these two former chief economists of the World Bank said, "We we are we really agree with you," 
And Roma came up and said, I'm, I, we had met last time in Maastricht in 1991 in the conference. I said, uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, why didn't I think about this earlier? Which, is, which I think is one of the most generous things that, 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 that someone can say, right? So, so, so they understand it, but their, their tenure in the World Bank also was not very long. Well, especially Roma. Roma was fired. That's right. <laughs> yeah. for, for, for having the wrong opinions. Yeah. So, 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 so I think, and if you combine this with the protectionism now in the U.S. and China, and everybody has to uh, do what they want, uh, except the poor countries who have to listen to the World Bank and the IMF, right? And it's an interesting th thing here also. If you look at Belarus and and the Ukraine, who were very similar wage level. Uh, the Ukraine wanted to be a democracy and had to follow the rules of the World Bank. Belarus was a dictatorship, an awful regime. But in 20 years, the wages in Belarus, who still followed the communist industrial strategy, almost doubled compared to the wages in, in the Ukraine. So, so we have a system which really, which really uh, supports dictators and punishes mm. democracies, because the democracies have to follow the World Bank and the IMF, and, and, and uh, dictatorships don't. So, so intelligent dictators can do it well. It's not because Lenin is on the square of Minsk. It's because they follow the, the old industrial policy. Sorry. Thank you, Eric. No, no worries. Fascinating. Yeah, Thank so, yeah. Us, I, yeah, I'm going to close. And uh, I know that, uh, yeah, I'm the one now who's standing between you and the, your drink. Uh, and I was told to be short. So I think I'm going to I'm gonna um, uh, not respond to all the questions. But I'm going to say that it was um, wonderful that someone would like more debates about value. <laughs> in the book, did not expect that. Um, so that's great. Um, there is some there are some in there. But yeah, of course, there could be more. And I think... Um, Office versus rents, even yeah. that distinction. Yeah. You can't do it without a theory of value. Yeah. So rent extraction, financialization is impossible. Exactly. Uh, and I think also what we do want to highlight, and maybe we could do more in the book, is kind of the power struggle over this, right? Over the extraction of value. Exactly. Uh, and that could maybe be an answer to almost all the questions um, in terms of the global currency hierarchy. Um, you know, what do you need to do? You know, it's a power struggle. You need to change the international monetary system. Uh, Devika Dutt is the person to go to for that. We wrote her PhD mm -hmm. thesis on this uh, and why, you know, countries need to accumulate reserves. And that's a rational thing to do. Even though it's expensive, in if if unless you change the system, that's rational. Um, also, corruption, you know, uh, the way it's used in in by development economists to basically discipline the countries that they want to discipline um, that are corrupt, whereas actually corruption is everywhere, uh, including in the UK. But there's no consequence there because we are we are the UK is not disciplined by the World Bank. Uh, same with the digital currencies. I think the. You know, a lot of people had a lot of, um, um, they believe that digital, uh, digital currencies could be a way to democratize money. <laughs> no, it's like still embedded in the power hierarchies um, that we have in the world. So that's another kind of yeah. thing. And then finally, the, the final question, which I could, would love to talk uh, more about, uh, how to end the hegemony of the mainstream. Uh, also, a power struggle. Um, that, you know, it's not something that you can fix easily. It's, you know, we need the student movements, build alternative movements, have these spaces you know, for to kind of challenge and build alternatives, uh, but ultimately it's um, yeah, it's something that's very very difficult and really needs organization. Um, and then I, maybe we can talk about the advice uh, uh, over drinks. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, just out of respect, also for all the work that people like Eric, ourselves, you do, actually is having quite a bit of. I mean, some bits are having big impact, and we're you know managing to to change things, telling those stories, and also talking to those who are changing them and elevating their voices versus the narrative, which as Eric's work has always told us, there's a mismatch between what's actually happening in the world and the narratives we tell. It's very important. Um, thank you. you know, in Italy, corruption, we all know that we are one of the you know, founders of it, uh, the mafia, which you've all seen. <laughs> it's a form of corruption. In fact, it came about when Italy, when Sicily was, um, was being basically didn't have the kind of development they had in the north for all sorts of reasons. And uh, in, because of the weak state, they had self-help organizations. And they had the Società de Beati Pali, which ultimately became Cosa Nostra. But today, because of that history, and because of the worry about corruption, it actually really hurts Italy. 
not, not the corruption, the worry about corruption. So procurement, something that we obsess about here as a tool of government policy, to have green procurement, outcomes-oriented procurement. The Apollo program began with the whole change in procurement in Italy. is under an agency called ANAC, l'Agenzia Nazionale dell'Anticorruzione. So a tool that could be ambitious, could be mission-oriented, also held accountable, is done in an agency that's worried about corruption. So imagine, you know, why is it that then we have really boring procurement, procurement and parasitic public-private just kind of handouts of money as opposed to ambition conditions on that outcome, right? So you get this ironic that it's easier to become corrupted when you worry about corruption because there's no public purpose. Anyway, on that note, uh, have a drink. We, um, at some point, you gotta leave this place because we have to close it down. But in the meantime, there's chips, crisps, wine, beer. And thank you so much. It was absolutely fascinating. Thank you for the work. Yeah.